This is how legends are made. Legendary. There's so many legends in this building today. Legendary. Well, today we have an incredible treat. One of my dear friends. Not only do I admire him, he has the Grammys, he has the accolades, he has more success than most people you would ever be able to communicate or talk to. He's also a friend, and I truly love him and his style. So today, Ron, we welcome you. Welcome, Ron Fair. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that so much. I feel the same way, man. This is going to be great. I can't wait to talk to you. Oh, that's great. Well, as, as we've discussed, you know, Legendary I Lived It is all about talking to people who have actually lived it, uh, sometimes behind the scenes, sometimes in front of a lot of people, uh, interviewed my kids, which was amazing talking to them. It was like therapy. Yeah. Uh, but I, I want it to be a conversation because I'm, I'm a guy that used to sit back and take notes and, you know, hoping someday I would meet the guy I saw on paper and started meeting many of them as the careers took off and you were at the head of the list. So when you walked in, it was one of those moments of, uh, I, I not only like him and you became a friend, but it was one of those, I can't believe I'm in the room with the Ron Fair. So, well, thank you. Here we are. Here we are. So I wanted to talk to you first about where it all began. Where are you from? How did you end up with this love for music that we all can appreciate today? Where did it start? Well, it will have to go back to uh, the very, very beginning, which was as a child. My, um, my mother's father was a broadcaster. Uh, that We were a Jewish family that basically, not through Ellis Island, but emigrated over here through Eastern Europe, World War II. We'll just we'll go quickly over that. But when my grandparents... My grandmother was a, a Yiddish actress, and they performed plays and repertory all in Yiddish, which was the language of the the really the the the, the Jews that were killed in the Holocaust. It was right. uh, like a mother tongue, uh, uh, mom, mama lushen as they called it, and um, it's pretty much wiped out now. But when my grandparents set up shop in Los Angeles in the '40s, my grandfather, who was a theatrical producer and an author, he started a radio broadcast, and it ran for 25 years, five days a week. Wow. And it was called the Jewish Hour. I don't think you know this about about me, Kevin. I never I mentioned. Had no it. idea. Yeah. So he had. They built a uh, a recording studio on the grounds of their home in Los Angeles in an outbuilding, probably like very common to what we do nowadays, where we have like a, a a garage or something in the back property where we do recordings. And it was uh, broadcast through special FCC lines that ran underground through a radio station called KALI, which was an AM station. So right from the get-go, at age two, three, four, I was around tape recorders, turntables, microphones, and I watched this whole broadcast uh, take place and the production of the broadcast um, really from infancy. And remember recording my voice on my grandfather's reel-to-reel -reel machines through the big silver microphone, you know, when I was two, three, four years old. So it makes perfect sense that I would end up in a field of endeavor that is not only musical, but technical with the audio side of it. Uh, my mother was a uh, concert pianist. She studied at Juilliard. My father was an opera singer. His brother was in the Metropolitan Opera, Uncle Joe. Uh, so I grew up in a in a, um, a, a theatrical, classical music, opera, musical comedy uh, household where we would on weekends do our own version of Oklahoma, Fiddler on the Roof, My Fair Lady, <laughs> you know, all, uh, all the Rogers all the Rogers and Hammers at the sound of music, we would stage those plays for ourselves and sing every song and we knew every word. And between my mother and myself would play the piano. Um, of course, uh, I, I guess it's no mystery. I'm, I'm a baby boomer. I turned 13 years old in 1968 in the summer of love, which enter the doors, Jimi Hendrix, uh, Judy Collins, Joan Baez, Joni Mitchell, you know, the golden days really of, of, uh, of rock and roll and and, and uh, youth pop and everything around it, Sly and the Family Stones, Stevie Wonder, like all these things, mm. the Beatles, uh, the Stones the were best. all the happening best. around me as a kid. So we know that as you know, as kids, these songs that are popular mark your life. And it wasn't long before I wanted the immediacy of a guitar and was pretty much self-taught on guitar. Mm. Started in little bands junior high bands, high school bands, played at dances, 
I came across a, I'm really going through quickly as possible. I came across a, 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 a visionary music teacher in high school, Mr. Waddell of Birmingham High School. Same teacher, by the way, as Diane Warren. Mr. Waddell, as when I was in the 11th grade, I was uh, 15, he unlocked everything for me with a system of music theory that was so earth shattering for me that by the time I entered college, I knew all the modes, all the keys, all the time signatures. I, I knew I was able to analyze four part Bach. I was really, really on my way to, to higher learning in music theory. As an instrumentalist, I always was lagging behind my mental ability and struggled for many years to try and play at the level of what I could hear. And it wasn't until uh, I was 22 when I ran across Bill Conti, the esteemed composer, uh, working in a crappy little studio. It was called Hollywood Spectrum. It was not in Hollywood. But um, when I ran into Bill Conti, he took me under his wing. Um, we we went one day to a small stu uh, to a studio in um, in uh, Hollywood, and it was another day with Bill where he was doing all kinds of small independent movie scores, and uh, one of those happened to be the score for the film Rocky, the famous Sylvester <laughs> Stallone, uh, you know, movie that changed the world for everybody. Yeah, not a and bad that, way. Not a bad way to start. Well, I was there with Bill at his side. I was his assistant. I was trained to know when to turn the harp mic on or off because it was sitting next to the trumpets. And I can say pretty clearly that with that the entire score for the film Rocky and all the songs and edits and extra material were recorded and mixed in three hours. What? Uh, yeah. And it, and it launched this uh, incredible, because it was a scoring gig, it launched this incredible number one pop instrumental called Gonna Fly Now. Yeah. which had background vocals on the chorus and the music from Rocky as is the movie and Sylvester Stallone all were launched into permanent stardom forever. One of the greatest, you know, things really ever to be created in Hollywood. Wait for the geek in me. You said three hours soup to nuts. Yeah. The whole song yeah, set up the, everything, the movie score, the songs, everything was a three hour session. It was, you know, that's, that's really all that was required. It was a great orchestra um it was uh i can remember some of the guys who were on the session dennis budamir on guitar he's a big solo and gonna fly now steve schaefer on drums it was it was incredible and bill conti was the coolest person ever in my life you know in some respects closer to me than my own father but uh so fast forward a little bit rocky took over the world every marching band every talk yeah. show every, everybody was playing you know, feeling stronger and with the trumpets in the beginning. Bah, 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 bah. So um, I was continuing to try to be a jazz fusion pianist and had I was always good at getting studio time and organizing sessions and probably the worst musician among my friends, but the best at getting studio time and opportunities to record and learning how to mm -hmm. record. Bill Conti came to the studio. Um, it was across from the Capitol Tower, not there anymore ironically kevin and um <laughs> and uh walked in he had this thing wrapped up in brown paper and he ripped the paper off and unfurled what is really my first gold record and handed it to me in front of my friends which was the coolest and most magnificent thing that could happen to a 22 year old to have a gold record for you know for anything let yeah. alone handed to me in front of my friends Wait, wait, wait. Your first gold record was the score for Rocky. Yes, the album, the soundtrack album, handed given to me by Bill Conti. And Bill said to me then, and then we can now we can leave the history behind after I give you the punchline. He said to me, Ron, as he gave it to me in front of my friends, about six of us trying to do really bad fusion. Right. Um, and he said to me, Ron, you you know, you're you're a half-ass piano player at the best. You're a half-ass arranger. You're certainly a half-ass engineer. Take all these half-asses and add them up, and, and you'll be a producer, and you'll be a great producer. Wow. Just don't do any of this stuff by itself, because you half-ass. So Bill had so much gravitas and so much love in his heart, and we were I, I just worshipped him, also a very, very badass jazz piano player in his own right that when he said that to me it changed my life 
Oh, I can and imagine. Realize, you know, stop playing the piano on the records, delegate more, don't engineer, like let other people do these things, but oversee it as a producer. Uh, you know, I went through something similar because, you know, I sing. I would yeah. say I'm a good singer. There are better, far better. But I went into Nashville, sat down at a piano, and then gave it to the session player who was one of the Nashville cats and said, nah, I don't think I should play the piano. And then Brent Rowan came in to play guitar, quadruple scale. Uh, I'm never going to touch the guitar again. And, and I went oh, through this, but yeah. not not with a hatred of, you know, oh no, I feel bad. It didn't depress me. It just made me think, it, I, I can probably, if I just let them do their job, they'll take what little bit I have and make it much better. And so I, I started moving towards songwriting in the music business, which helped me as a person. Well, I had a mentor in Bill Conti that showed me the path and I was forever. I'm forever grateful. I'm, you know, I love him. Anyway. Uh, great, great moment. Though. And then the next piece of the puzzle was, of course, I was an unemployed producer. <laughs> and, um, right. And with no prospects, but I did look good in a suit and I spoke well and I was able to, I was doing publishing demos for United Artists Music. Uh, Danny Strick hired me and I did, publishing demos all week long with a little four piece band. We didn't have pro tools. We didn't have digital anything. It was what, what year band, was that? Uh, uh, 1979. And Danny Strick. Hired he, was, he was the youngest head of a music publishing company ever. He was like 25 and he was senior VP. Wow. Uh, you did you, I think you knew he signed my son's first publishing deal. <laughs> that's, that's great. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> He was, my, he was my he was my he was my doctor's son. Actually, he was my ex wife's doctor's son, and that's how we met. Wow. Well, but, uh, his wife also did the uh, reality show Married to Jonas. Oh my God. Yeah, lots of ties with that family. Yeah, funny. We, we love. I, I like the show, by the way. I, I enjoyed it. Yeah. So, um, so out of those publishing demos, I there's a little local paper in L.A. for aspiring bands called Music Connection. Mm -hmm. And Music Connection would tell you, would say like, so-and-so got signed and this, you know, it was like for this little underbelly ecosystem of wannabe people in the industry, which I was. So uh, I pitched, um, I pitched uh, Mike Dolan, and Eric Patelli, the owners of the magazine. Hey, let me write an article about what is a publishing demo supposed to be? Because by then a lot of my demos were getting cut. And, and becoming records produced by other people, but the, the song demos were effective. And, right. uh, and so in so writing that article, which I got $25 for, I uh, went from to, around to different A&R people playing to their ego. Because when you call up and say, hey, I'm a new producer, I want to have a meeting, you're not going to get a meeting. Correct. But when you call up and say, I'm a journalist for Music Connection Magazine and I want to interview you, then you're going to get <laughs> so That's great. So I... I uh, there was a fellow uh, at the very, very beginning named Barry Oslander, who I interviewed, and um, he took a liking to me, and he asked me to put together a, a reel of, of things, which I did, and um, that led to a meeting with the president of the company in 19, uh, mid midway in 81. There's a fellow named Jack Crago, president of RCA. Mm -hmm. And um, this is a, kind of a good story, and this is what podcasts are for. So uh, it was uh, Barry said, Jack Craig goes wants to meet with you about a potential A and R position, entry level A and R position. Would you? Is that something you would do? And it was like I thought, well, I'm a producer, and I hate A and R people, and why would I ever be one? But then I thought, if I'm an A and R person, maybe I can hire myself to produce a record. So uh, That's since a great nobody idea. else was hiring, yeah. <laughs> So uh, um, the meeting was called for like Tuesday afternoon and like four o'clock. So I got there and I waited. It was like four, four thirty, five o'clock, five thirty, about quarter of six after waiting nearly two hours. And I kept looking over to my left and they had the plastic replica of the RCA dog nipper life size or bigger than life size, like giant plastic dog. But the plastic dog was chained to the couch because people kept stealing the plastic dog. 
<laughs> so that's the metaphor. I'm like the dog, the dog, the pla- the dead plastic dog is chained down and I'm waiting two hours to have a meeting. And uh, then the secretary came out and said, uh, Mr. Jack, Mr. Jack Crago cannot meet with you today. We're really sorry. He's, he's tied up. Can uh-huh. you come back tomorrow? It's like, well, uh, I, I, okay. The same scenario, Kevin, it happened a few times in a row where they kept me waiting for a few hours. And it wasn't until Friday afternoon of that week, like by then it was like six o'clock. I had been waiting next to the plastic dog for a couple more hours. I read every magazine on the table, the whole thing. Right. Per day. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and it was Jack, we'll see you now. So I go in and by then I'm pretty pissed off. Right. And I'm arrogant and I'm uh, 24 years old, broke want to be Hollywood producer with one gold record to his name, wh- which I earned as an assistant. <laughs> so uh, um, Jack asked me, so what do you think is wrong with the business today? And I said, well, it's groups like Toto that are made up of studio guys. They're not real artists. They're just a bunch of great session musicians that are able to cobble together a hit because they're so excellent at playing, but they're not a real artist because they don't have a real lead singer who's a real star. It's just a bunch of studio fabrications. And I went off on this whole tirade about Toto, of all things, which was, <laughs> which was big. And he said to me then, I signed Toto. And I sat <laughs> in my chair and I was like, oh, shit, I'm dead meat. I just, oh, that's I just, funny. And then his, the next words out of his mouth, as God is my witness, were how soon can you start? Wow. And uh, I guess it was speaking my mind. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. And, uh, and so I became a, did he, a, a did he, man in 1981. Wow. So and then I was, did uh, it I cross your mind? Play. Because I know you and how you speak your mind. And it's one of the things I love most about you is I've been with you where you told an artist to get their own head out of their own ass. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and it was needed and and important. And though you are honest, and there's something about your honesty, I've seen it bring light and bring... You know, I saw you say to Nick once, this is really great, my son Nick, this is really great, but your drum tracks need to be beefed up. And you left. And he was like, ugh, he's right. And nobody wants to hear that, and the tendency is for most people in the world to go, I don't know if I should say this or not. One of the things I love most about you is you, you say it. And but you're right. Your discernment is good. You're you're accurate. Well, you know, as behind the scenes players in 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 what we do, number one, you you want you want to keep the job. You want to keep working with the artists. You want to keep working with the record company. So you know, oftentimes you might be intimidated to say when asked, you know, what do you think, and and you might not want to say it because of things like tactfulness or timing or whatever. Um, and it's, you know, it's gotten me in trouble quite a lot throughout my life. I've been, I'm probably as many great positions as I've held and success that I've been lucky enough to have, I've been fired. And um, s- sometimes people don't want to hear it. Uh, and, yeah. the, and, and the result is adios. So uh, maybe I'm the most fired uh, <laughs> person in the history of the music business. I might be. Um but but that did that sometimes it that leads didn't to a hit. affect anything you know well, what? i'll tell you a story it's very timely right now we're just doing the t- uh, experiencing the 20th anniversary of christina aguilera's what was her fourth album but considered her second album stripped right and, and an artist well known for having very strong opinions herself well we at that time because i knew christina so well i had taken the position of standing behind her vision and seeing the world through her eyes but also trying to elevate whatever it was she was on about uh, without placing judgment on it. It didn't have to be my way or it was always her way. But, but on, when it came to the song beautiful, um, Linda Perry produced it and wrote it. And, you know, you could say in some respects that it was Linda's movie. She was directing the movie, but Christina starred in the movie. Yeah. And there was a, we got into a little bit of an argument about the piano part on, on beautiful. And uh, Linda was very upset with me. And I, sa- I said something like, you know, I think you could do it better. And um, 
she got upset with me and and then I suggested still thinking of a way to get that piano part better mm-hmm. I suggested that uh, we get Elton to play the piano on beautiful thinking wow. like you know as a guy playing cards like okay queen king ace <laughs> Elton. Yeah, exactly and where so that made Linda even angrier because I was trying to up the ante and um, of course Elton and Christina on that song they might have even done it somewhere on one of the TV shows but it would have been would have been great, but um, I, I left. I, I, I may have been asked to leave. I don't really remember. It's twenty years ago. But the point is, Linda replayed the piano for herself and really elevated it wow. and and solved the problem uh, her way, which is how she should how problems in the studio should be solved by the artist and by the musicians, not by the overseer. At the same time, I make my own records and. Sometimes people make suggestions to me that I don't like, but they 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 uh, they spur on further thought about the assembly of the creative elements and the musical elements. And you know, it's like a prism. You look at it from every angle mm-hmm. and then make a decision. But in the case of Beautiful, uh, regardless of the genesis, she replayed the piano. It's a gorgeous record. It's a forever record. Um, it's an incredible piece of of all of our lives now and as wonderful as that record is it's better because you spoke your mind you know i I wouldn't pat myself on the back i just when you're in the when you're in the kitchen that's where the cooking's done it's got to be you got to be able to try things you got to be able to throw things away and you know the I think all recording, I think like, especially somebody like Taylor Swift, like you really get the sense that she's recording with no regard to the outcome. Mm-hmm. She's not sitting there thinking, well, if I do this and say this, then I'm going to have a hit or she's at this level where she's just expressing herself and it's, she's doing it any way she wants. And the audience goes with her because they trust her and they believe her and they love it, but it's never the creation with regard to, to the outcome it's creation for the moment and yeah. and that's really the the most fun of it is when the little red light goes on and something great happens wow well with that in mind because you've worked with the best of the best you you've had some incredible things that i'm going to make sure we get into but when the red light goes on and you've worked with so many great vocalists when you reached and hit record and then you walked away from the session, what was the session that took your breath away? That would be, that's really hard. Um, hard to say. Uh, probably Mary J. Blige. Oh. I think that we were tasked with uh, coming up with a, a better version, an improved version of Be Without You. And um, it was a different, it was at that moment in time, Be Without You was going to be used to be a lead off single for what was a greatest hits package. Hmm. And, uh, Jimmy Iovine asked me to drop what I was doing and fly to New York. I knew Mary a little bit. She she had liked a couple records I made. We, cross paths. I'd signed Keisha Cole, made a bunch of records with Keisha. So Mary was aware of who I was and uh, I was in the studio with her and um, Be Without You was one of these from start to finish supercharged. You could tell in the room. Wow. Went on to be number one for 17 weeks at, at, at R&B radio and five weeks at pop radio. And then probably another one, you could probably do its own documentary would be Lady Marmalade. Ooh. So, so Lady Marmalade was uh, a plot point in the movie um, Moulin Rouge. Mm-hmm. And the, the, Baz Luhrmann. The, Baz Luhrmann, the genius director, did the Elvis movie, which was so great. Yep. Um, had a bunch of Joe was Joe songs. was in Joe that we've been discussing. Yeah. Was in as a kid. His first Broadway show was in Baz Luhrmann's version of La Boheme. 
I'm not surprised. I'm sure Joe was great in that too. He was great. So uh, that was a Baz Luhrmann saw me. Well, first of all, I was the link to Christina, and we borrowed her. I had just left RCA and became president of AM under Jimmy Ivy. But he saw me as a kind of necessary glue because Missy Elliott was the overseer. It was he wanted Missy's flavor. Mm. And he and and Missy brought in Rock Wilder to do the beat. And yet coordinating four different artists and different artist schedules and getting, you know, four very different artists between um Christina pink maya and little kim uh that there was a lot of moving parts to that and so i think baz saw me as a guy who could come in the team and st help stitch it together and so i ended up recording the vocals but they didn't record together they um and producing the vocals they, they recorded uh at different times and each brought incredible energy to it in their own way and it was it was the first time i i didn't know how to do the ad libs um, on an R and B record where you have four different vocalists that all need to take ad libs right. singing over over the backgrounds and over the progression. So I just because um if you remember your uh your music theory on uh, on Lady Marmalade, it's a mode. Da 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 over and over again. Da 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 so an yeah. an R and B ad lib is is kind of in that tonality. Yeah, Woo -woo! whatever whatever the lick is, it's all gonna go over. Da 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 da. da. So it doesn't really matter dun, if it's dun. before the chorus, in the middle of the verse. It's just I just need the lick, and I wanted it to be inspired. I didn't want to have to like make one up. Yeah, yeah, and, and like then aim it and and then give that constraint to the singer who's supposed to be vibing. Like you have to do it this way in this spot. So it's like just sing ad-libs all the way down the record from start to finish. Don't even worry about what's going on underneath. So it's a three and a half minute track going da 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 da. Perfect for R and B, right? Right. Except for, except for the bridge. So don't worry about the bridge. So each Christina Pink, my little even little Kim, they all just gave off the top of their head ad-libs. And if one of them was good, one of them happened to be good, I would say on talk like, do that one again, do that one again, listen to it real quick and do it again. So they were based on improvs. So it was all inspiration and wow. very little perspiration. And then I took the, I, so I had maybe 50 or 60 ad libs of each singer, including the rap ones. Right. And I put them all onto two different keyboards, sampled them and truncated them so that I knew one, two, three, four. If I hit it on four, it would come in in the pocket where it was supposed to be. Everybody was truncated to beat four. So wow. I'm triggering them by hand. And then I named them all. I learned every single ad lib. I learned them by name, up swoop, back door, <gasps> next day. Like I just gave them names and I knew next day was, yeah, whatever it was. And I played all the ad libs in and created a counterpoint on the record, which then they learned and were able to do it live. And it all made perfect sense as if they sung it that way naturally. But I got the best ad libs, most off, you know, most inspired off the top of their head. And, um, and so Lady Marmalade also has, a. There, everybody was a hero. Christina hit the gigantic high G yeah. in open chest voice. Pink came in with that salty tone. Yeah. She was like, like, you know, like lower range Joplin. Uh, little Kim had the flavor, the street thing. Mm -hmm. But Maya, who was kind of the unsung hero, Maya had the pocket. So all of the all of the all of the backgrounds, hey sister souls, all the feel of it was all Maya to begin with, and everybody jumped on Maya's groove and, and listened to Maya while they sang. Wow, so what a combination! Played, yeah, and then they went on. The, the thing went to number one about about five weeks after we finished it. The album was a giant smash. They won the Grammy for vocal collaboration. They performed it on the Grammys. Patti LaBelle came out of the state out of the you know, from out of, from an elevator. Um, so yeah, like you say, uh, the name of the podcast is what? I lived it. Legendary. I so, lived it. So, you know, there, there I was for, um, for that. And on Grammy night, of course, th this is really funny because, you know, while we're doing the deep dive as musos, if you bought a brand new core Triton at the time of 
Lady Marmalade, which was a, the dope keyboard of the day. Mm-hmm. If you happen to buy that, um, and you start and you press on the very first sound that comes on bank a sound zero 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 is called noisy stabber so you're going through the library of sounds so you get your brand new keyboard out of the box turn it on noisy stabber and that is the exact patch that's going it was like rock wilder got his new keyboard i don't know how to stop that beeping unfortunately it's just part of it i've i don't know if you're getting it but it's like Rock Wilder uh, bought a new keyboard, turned it on, hit the first thing that was on, and there it was. And went, wow, this would be a great and track. it was another wow, one. Wow, that's wow, the whole track. Wow. That's the whole track. <laughs> is the noise I've he played stabber. that. Obviously, it's the first thing you see. <laughs> yeah, so when we did, when we played it on the Grammys, I took it upon myself to play that part live. We had a live uh, horn section, and uh, the guy drumming that night was Abraham Laboreal, who is, we all know as McCartney's drummer now. But absolute, what a great absolute family. Great. But yeah, what yeah, a great so, guy. And Alex Al, who was Michael Jackson's bass player. Yep. Hey, um, he was I've been with him too. That's <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> so uh, that was full circle. It came, both of those records, wow. Be Without You, and well, all of them, Beautiful and Lady Marmalade, they, they came full circle. Rarified moments, you know, and, and uh, have to be appreciative for what they are. Oh, absolutely. Well, you mentioned Jimmy Iovine. And mm-hmm. of course, I've had some encounters with him, but not like you. How did you end up working with Jimmy? Because a lot of people know him. Do you know the they story, think, or, they think, or are you just asking? I, I, well, I I know the story. Okay, because it's there's a, good. There's a world of people that may not know the story, and it's one of my favorite stories of all time. But, well, but a lot of people know him from American Idol now yeah, and don't really or, or realize what a giant he is yeah, and yeah, what yeah. a great guy he is. So... I would love for the world to know how you teamed up with Jimmy Iovine. Okay, well, I'll tell you. So so there's a few a permutations to it, and I'll, so I'll say the somewhat more politically correct version of it. <laughs> um, so uh, basically, um, when Christina got, when Jeannie in a Bottle blew up, I signed Christina and oversaw her first five albums. Yeah. When she blew up, she got the cover of Rolling Stone, which is kind of the holy grail of stardom. Yeah, She's on the cover, and in the interview, they ask her, you know, well, how did Jeannie Bottle come about? And she says something to the effect of, "Well, my perfectionistic, totalitarian, mean A and R guy, Ron Fair, forced me to sing Jeannie in a Bottle." That so had to feel that, really good. But at that point in time, you know, Christina, it, 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 for whatever reason she said that she may have felt that or or she may have been transferring frustration onto me i don't know but it, i had always total amnesty and forgiveness for her she was basically like 17 years old and mm-hmm. on the cover of rolling stone so so okay if you want to say i forced you to sing genie in a bottle okay what am i going to do i didn't take it personally it didn't break my heart other things did but not that yeah um and uh so now fast forward but, uh, Rolling Stone is out. I'm in Winnipeg, the mosquito capital of the world, with where mosquitoes fly around like like seagulls. They're they're massive in, yes. in, in the summer. <laughs> and we're in the studio. I was on the road with her recording my kind of Christmas, her Christmas album, which is in later years has become very acclaimed. Mm-hmm. And um, and I was in the middle of like doing ooze on oh holy night or something like that because we i went on the road with her and recorded all the vocals while she was on tour because we didn't have time to stop and do a christmas record and um anyway uh i'm, I'm sitting there doing like literally like vocal retakes okay n- next note ooh, here we go two three four ooh, and the phone rings and it's the receptionist at the front of the studio saying Ron, there's a phone call for you. Jimmy Iovine's calling for you. So I, of course, was like, what? I, I don't really know Jimmy Iovine. Like, why would he be calling for me? He's like, Christina, give me a second. I got to take this call. I thought it was Danny Strick pranking me because he used to call up and say, it's Clive Davis. It's Walt Dianikoff. It's Jimmy Iovine. Like, he used to do that all the time. I can believe that with Danny. <laughs> so I think it's him pranking me. And I, so I start off by saying, look, I'm right in the middle of cutting ooze on Oh Holy Night, you know. And it was like, hey, Ron, it's Jimmy Ivey. <laughs> really? 
He goes, yeah, look, uh, you got a minute? I got Rolling Stone right here. It says in the magazine, you forced Christina Aguilera to sing Genie in a Bottle. Is that true? I didn't know what, what to say. I, I thought it was, I, I just didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to answer that question. So I was like, uh, uh, and he goes, well, if you could force her to sing a number one record like Genie in a Bottle, can you come and work for me and force all my artists to sing number ones? <laughs> oh, I love that story so much. That's amazing. And so I took a meeting with Jimmy and, you know, he's an incredibly generous, funny, wonderful guy. Yeah. And I said stuff to him like, well, you know, Jimmy, I'm a producer and because uh, I was at RCA. Right. And uh, I'm a producer. And so, you know, I, I like I, I should pretty much I, I got to have a studio. You want a studio? You want two studios? You want three studios? How many engineers do you want? You want five engineers? You want to work all night? Have three rooms going? It was like, wow, this guy gets me. Well, he and gets he you because me. he was also uh, he was a producer, yeah. executive producer, the extraordinaire. Yeah, for sure. He he got and, uh, that part that they can coexist. Yes, and a man who's threatened by no one, who whose rules of the road about not having ego, and it's not about you, and everything you read about Jimmy, what he learned from Springsteen and U two and Stevie Nicks and Tom Petty, yeah. um, all was my Harvard wow. as a record man. And so for 10 years, uh, Jimmy and I ruled the roost with um, starting with Lady Marmalade, moving to the Black Eyed Peas, the Pussycat Dolls, Vanessa Carlton, Mary J. Blige, Keisha Cole. And, um, you know, and that, that list of unknowns, were you just anxious for somebody to break? <laughs> 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 I mean, you know, reading through your credits, Ron, is uh, you, you have to probably sit back sometimes and go, did I really live this? Well, the, the main point, I think, and what I think is good for us guys, you and me, Kevin, uh, to, to do these kinds of things and talk about these, you know, there, first of all, there is no book. There's no history of any of this. So it's all about the village elders passing down the tribal things to the young braves on jungle drums, playing just the way we're doing. That's right. But the main thing, the main thing that I feel about all of it is it's really not any, having made those records, whatever, uh, doesn't do anything for me today in my life as a father and as a record maker. What matters today is relevance mm. and currency and understanding how the ball moves in music and how there's a lid for every pot. And now we have TikTok, which has an effect on the art itself and this egalitarian entry into our process of recording and discovery where so many things have a chance that never would have before. So really the, in spite of having had a, a very um, <coughs> fortunate past, really what keeps me going is staying relevant and, and in my strong suit in the today and in the future. Yeah. I completely understand that. And you know, I do it's, yeah. You know, we're not the kind of people that can sit back and go, well, I did something. It, it, there's, there's a drive that never leaves, and there's a creativity that just is constantly uh, moving. But also there's that balance. You know, I was, I was talking with Nick in an episode that we just did, and he asked me, he turned the, the question on me and said, what about you? What's your favorite Nick moment? And I went, uh, when your baby got home. When your baby, who was born early, finally after a hundred and plus days, is in your arms in your house, that's that's my favorite Nick moment of all time. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, you're certainly one of the legendary dads of all time, and everything you've seen. Um, oh, that's you know, and how it works. Like you know, again, like so many great things, including the Jonas Brothers, were passed on or overlooked, and they ended up being the thing that moves the entire cultural needle of the world it's it's you amazing very common. yeah well you know one thing that i told my kids and i got it from a guy named john maxwell it was if you can't beat them and i hate it if you can't beat them join them if you can't beat them outlast them and that's been kind of a family motto is, is just keep plowing just keep working you're gonna find a sucker <laughs> 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 in every sense, including the song sucker. Oh yeah, I gotta remember that. That was a great one. 
Yeah, that was a great way for them to come back. Well, that's that's pretty amazing. I would love to ask you about Fergie because there's a journey that's personal on so many levels for you, but also the journey that involves her career and how she ended up in so many places that we all know now. Uh, but how did that relationship begin? Well, that, that's got a, a lot of levels to it. So it started when I was uh, vice president of senior vice president of ANR at EMI Records. So this is going maybe the late 80s, 89, no, no probably 91. Yep. And um, there's a, an esteemed a publisher, music biz guy named Jim Velotato, who, uh, who brought in, he said, I have a girl group, they write their own songs, and they were called Wild Orchid. And uh, I took a meeting with them. They had, they had faltered on a demo look-see deal with, with Columbia Records, with Randy Jackson, that, that failed to materialize into anything. And he walked them into my office in, at the time in Hollywood, and the group was Stacy Ferguson, who became Fergie, Stephanie Rydell, who many years later I married and have four children with <laughs> right? Uh, and, and nothing at the time. And Renee, uh, who was a, a big star on kids incorporated. I remember uh, that's amazing. And a big TV show at the time. So they sang three part harmony. Like they might as well have been the I They sang R and B music, three white chicks, gorgeous teenagers that there was no possible way it could miss in my book. And I became obsessed with Wild Orchid. I signed them to RCA. And we toiled and toiled and toiled for a number of years, putting out uh, two or two and a half albums without ever really getting a hit single. And this was in the time of the Spice Girls. So the, there was a lot at, uh, to learn from it, just in terms of how unfair it is to be a female artist mm as opposed to a male and be judged by things like the clothes you wear, the lip liner, the eye makeup, the tightness of, uh, of the fit. But in, but with females in pop, all of those things do come into it. And I was a guy who was a music guy and following the music impulses and the other pieces of the puzzle that would have maybe helped us get through some of the, some of the hurdles mm -hmm. there. They weren't there on the label part and they weren't there on the management part. So ultimately it did not work, but musically it worked. Although we didn't have a hit, all the lessons were learned so that when I met the very young Christina Aguilera, everything that I had been trying, striving for with Wild Orchid was transferred to Christina and it worked as a solo singer with background parts, but it was our, it was, it was white chick R and B and it was very, very strong. <clears throat> But um, so Wild Orchid uh, fired me off off their record, and um, I went on to uh, to work on Christina, and then ultimately left and joined up with Jimmy. So the Black Eyed Peas had experimented with different females in the group, and it was Jimmy Iovine's idea. This is oftentimes how we work. He was the pitcher, and I was the catcher. So he, he said to me, you know, hey, what about that girl, that girl you had, that blonde girl? What, that, what about her? Um, he had expressed interest in her earlier when I was at RCA. He actually at one point reached out and was trying to sign her or something, not understanding she was in a group already. But mm -hmm. I got to, when I got to Jimmy, um, he said, go back and get that blonde girl. A lot of time had passed. Like I said, I was fired off Wild Orchid, which was a heartbreak. And, and I found out that Stacy, who became Fergie, knew Will I Am, that they had been pals, that they had gone to concerts together, that she was around and she knew Will. And Jimmy said, Go get that girl that you had, put her in the group. That's basically what, <laughs> what he said. And um, well, there's a lot to that because she had other plans at the time. Will had other plans at the time. And mm -hmm. so we let's just say that I had a hand in lubricating the relationship so that it made it feel like a, a, a good fit for, for Stacy to, to become Fergie and join the Black Eyed Peas. But she had a very, very good teacher who was Will I Am. Will I Am was the epitome of cool. He knew how to stand, how to walk, how to be, how to hang, how to sing. Will I Am is a giant and 
his influence on her helped her become the best version of herself that she ever was. And so inside of the group, uh, she just became a gigantic star. Yeah. It was, yeah, it was and it was massive. a great balance. It was a great balance. And it was the, the character that she played in the Black Eyed Peas is very much like her. Kind of a hip, street, loose, fun, great hang. And she got to do all that inside the music. And and uh it was one of one of our big success, me and Jimmy's big success together. I think between uh, Ella Funk and um and um second I can't remember the name of the second album though, Monkey Business. Yeah. Elephant and Monkey Biz. I think we sold 17 million albums in those days. That was quite a lot. And then made the solo album with Fergie, which was called The Duchess, mm -hmm. which had uh, Glamorous on it. It had, you know, the the, the one that uh, Jack Harlow interpolated into First Class. Right. And it had a, a very, very big pop song called Big Girls Don't Cry. Yeah. Wow. And the songwriter on Big Girls Don't Cry. Oh, wait. I think Will... Will and Fergie may have co-written that. I don't. I don't really remember. I think it was the same guy that wrote for Demi, uh, wrote Skyscraper. But but I think he was one of the co-writers. Okay. But I'll I'll check that. I'm not surprised. Yeah. But, well, um, you know, with with Fergie's those songs, uh, how like how involved were you? And I I know because I know you. How involved were you in saying this one is raising its hand? Probably in the in the from the point of view of which song, it's kind of like all the little puppies in the box in, in front of the supermarket. So how I how I look at it, they're all cute, they're all cuddly. You love them all. So how do you know which one? If you feed them all, brush them all, give them the you know the love and the medicine and the sunlight and the playing outside that they all deserve, how do you know which puppy? Is going to be the big the best dog right when they're at that stage and the truth is you don't you don't know the the dog becomes the dog it's supposed to become all on its own mm. and um we can't really pick they pick themselves so uh you know with the people around me like jimmy ivine or steve berman or brenda romano or the people that were in that time period i would just make all the puppies the best they could be and let them decide. And, and I never, except for maybe in one, one or two cases where I pushed the button on which song, and that would definitely be in the Pussycat Dolls. Uh, Cause after Don't Show was gigantic number one, I felt like there's no possible way we're going to have another dance record. That's going to be as big. It's just not going to happen. It, yeah, it does. It's it just was not going to happen. Just a monster. It, yeah. Just a monster. So I thought if we switch it up and come with the sing song, mom friendly uh hallmarky greeting card kind of a song that it wouldn't ever be judged in the same light as the dance record and that if we could have that come as a as a second single and it's a hit that it would break the group and i was right and the song was stick with you that franny goldie wrote such and, uh, a great great choice I that was love... supposed to be for mary that was supposed to be for mary j blige jimmy wanted a pop song for mary because be, uh, We Belong Together was Mariah's pop song, and it was doing great. And he said, you know, give Mary a pop song. And um, it was too pop for Mary. Yeah. And she said, I love the song. It's just too pop. And I was like, well, it's supposed to be pop. And then Nicole, Mary left the studio. I was dejected. And then in walks Nicole. It was a record plant. And uh, she said, what's wrong? I said, well, Mary just doesn't want to do the pop song. I think it's a smash. She goes, let me hear it. And her album was done. So she hears, <laughs> she goes, let me put my voice on it right now. It's like, okay. And that oh became my gosh. Record. Unbelievable. Well, so, so I know you've moved to Nashville, which yeah. I love. So many of my friends from LA and, and New York have moved to Nashville and are there. Uh, actually, I am at the top of the month taking over a home on Music Row. Uh, wow. So... Planning my flag after all these years. Oh, fantastic! In the place where I've literally knocked on every door as a struggling oh, songwriter. Wow. So, oh, wow! Oh, well, that's great. I, I, my heart. I'm emotional about it. Uh, had a that's couple wow. big moments recently, and that's that's one for me that I wanted to be in that spot that means so much to me historically. Um, 
but you're there now. What are the projects that you're working on? You know, I know, you know, you you cover from classical to country to Christmas. I mean, and pop and beyond. Yeah, I don't have a Christmas record this year, which I'm I'm a little bummed out about. But I've I've had uh, my Christmas playlist is like 150 songs now. Amazing. Um, Christina, the OJ's Fantasia, John Pizzarelli, Darren Chris, Adina Menzel, Runaway June. Yep. Laney Wilson. Amazing. So, Amazing. Yeah, we did Laney Wilson's Christmas record uh, two years ago. And look now at she's, what's she's, going on. Yeah, so I'm, I'm super You proud know, of uh, my songwriter that I have has two songs on the new record. So I'm really, Fantastic. yeah, really Which excited. One? Which songs do they have? Um, Hillbilly Hippie and Those Boots. Okay. Well, Laney Wilson's the real deal and, you know, she deserves it all. But um, so current projects are... It, it, uh, are spread out a little bit. I have two country projects that are active. Um, uh, Dave's Highway, the record just came out last Friday. It's a brother-sister act from Jackson, Mississippi. Two girls, Great. two sisters and a brother that have that God-given three-part harmony that's nuts. Yep. And uh, their first record is out as of last Friday. And we have seven seven more in the oven. So our, our idea is to have like a double EP come as soon as the, the clouds clear from Christmas and stuff. And they're they're uh, opening for Darius Rucker and out there in the sensational Dave's oh, Highway. That's great. their last name. Their last name is Dave's. D a v e s. It's not a, it's not <laughs> Dave's apostrophe s. It's Dave's. Well, Highway. Jonas is actually a first name throughout all of <laughs> Europe. It's or Jonas. Yeah. Yeah. So, and the other country act is uh, uh, a new African American voice entirely. Tony Evans Jr., who uh, I really want to show to you and Phil actually. Um, who is he's a gentle baritone with a throwbacky Glenn Campbell kind of sound. Oh, very cool. And, and he's fantastic and he's on his way with the socials and and uh, we are we're about we just made our deal for independent distribution. So Tony Evans Jr., you can find him on on TikTok. And then um in the classical space, uh Lang Lang, the Disney book. His real name is Long Long, but we say Lang Lang, and he's the foremost classical wow. And it's recording today, and it's uh, 28 songs done all different ways, but with a classical feel, including duets with Bocelli and John Batiste and uh, Sebastian Yatra, who sang the big song from Encanto. Wow. He actually plays We Don't Talk About Bruno uh, on solo piano. It's fantastic. And we'll find out tomorrow where we stand on the Grammys. Uh, we were eligible for a bunch, and we're finding out tomorrow. Um, and then, so the country, the the uh two projects long lungs classical project and then this one's you can't i i mean you can't write this but uh um, i signed keisha cole and made most of her records out of five albums she she made i've made four of them and i say made like collaborating on the music part oftentimes working on the music but always the vocals and the arrangements and i signed her but um about two years ago <clears throat> we were maybe one glass of wine in <clears throat> And it's like, we should make a movie. Yeah. Another, have another sip. Yeah. A biopic, a Keisha Cole life story. Yeah. Open the next bottle. Yeah. It'd be great. Yeah. And I'll play myself. Sure. So we have this crazy, you know, bottle of wine, which led to let's make a movie. But lo and behold, uh, we start principal photography of the Monday after Thanksgiving. Oh, Lifetime great. Network has picked it up. We have a fantastic script. Keisha's pay playing herself. And um, we're making a live story biopic, which will come out in the quarter one, along with her star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame and a new album and a whole brand new Keisha Cole 2.0 oh, on the back of this movie. Yeah. So we start, um, there's a great, great new song for it. And then some of her oldies, but it's not uh, a biopic about here I am in my Gucci boots singing another hit. It's really a story of her and her mother. Mm. Um, her mother was, She's Keisha Cole never knew who her dad was. And her mom was like a tragic character who, who lived on the streets, who, who uh, was a lady of the night, who was in prison, who really struggled her whole life. And part of Keisha's mission in life was to sort of save her mom and bring the family back together. She had a foster family and, you know, just a lot of half sisters and brothers. And, and um, it's, it's very, very uh, a gritty family drama. 
and um it's amazing with oh, some music sounds, with a few with a few songs in the background yeah there's a few of her hits play in the storyline but it's really about her life and coming to grips with her mother amazing yeah you know ron that starts a week from that starts a monday after thanksgiving <clears throat> start shooting i mean we got it we got the movie it's it's just you know that journey is so fun to see something go from nothing an idea over the table yeah. to a realization and we've we've both seen a good number of those uh mine pale in comparison to yours but uh -huh. you know you're you're one of those guys that you know i saw the name i watched it i studied it and then i met you and i found a friend and you know what's interesting too in a lot of these i mean it's gone from tony orlando to my sons cc winans to you like it's there's a scale there's a scope in these interviews that's really but even the people listening the people editing they're like these are the nicest people and it may just be the people that i'm personally drawn to but some really great souls out there you know the music business is not all trash and it's not all garbage and i say that as a guy that was very protective with my family uh there's a lot of good souls out there and you are one of those my friend thank you i really do believe that i have a question that i need to give you ron fair what is your favorite subway sandwich my favorite subway sandwich is really simple it's just the brown uh seven grain bread and swiss cheese no mustard no lettuce no meat nothing cheese bread heat melt the end That's i would eat, i would eat that tomorrow i'm that yeah. kind of guy ron i love you love you too appreciate man appreciate you so much thank you so much i'm for, gonna catch for... you in nashville we're gonna okay. do a collection of like my friends in nashville and do a round table if you're open to that oh that that sounds great i know phil and i are, are overdue to get together It'll be Phil, yourself. It'll be, you know, from radio to songwriters to mega producers. It's it, exactly. Is that going to be in your new building? And will your building be ready? Uh, we're taking it over as is. It's old and it's special. It's a stop on the bus literally stops in front of our house because Taylor Swift, I think, wrote a lot of her early hits right at the house and right behind it. Uh, Bob DePiro is there now. Fantastic. Underneath. So, yeah, I w we'll either do it there, but there's a video studio that I've used for podcast stuff that we'll do it there. But we'll we'll set that up. Awesome, man. Thank you so much. Ron, thank you. Thanks Love for the you. thanks for the um, getting that script to Joe. It's a pretty interesting thing. Uh, you know, pe people are they're, – they're mer it's Merchant Ivory, so they're, it's a very art reputable art house film studio. You got it. Well, actually, okay. I'm flying tomorrow to join him for Devotion, the movie – the korea war movie that big one that's coming out this week so i'm flying to the premiere tomorrow fantastic yeah i'm at safe travels give my best to your family i will lots of love and you you too bye-bye bye. well that was ron fair you can see why i love him why he's a friend but oh man the credits this man has well i hope you enjoyed the podcast today please remember to subscribe where you can to rate to follow please share with your friends i think that there's a lot of life lessons in the life lessons these guys have. They may be talking about music. They might just be talking about you. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.